Thanks, Stuart. Happy to have you here. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, pleasure to be here. And normally I like to walk around, but I think I'm, I have to stay back here for the microphone. So I'm not hiding. Um, all right, I'm going to talk about climate. What is climate? What is climate change? Don't confuse climate with weather, right? You go outside today or last week in our shirt sleeves, that's unusually warm weather, right? Whole lot, that's one data point. Whole lot of data points like that altogether over a long time over the world makes climate. Okay, when I was a young lad, my mama told me, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them what you told them. So here's what I'm going to tell you, right? This is all issues on climate. We can observe it, we can understand what drives it, we can figure out how it works, we can look into the future, look at the impacts, and then talk about energy. First, some observations, okay? Um, hmm. Human population, first of all, from essentially zero to huge, right? Right now, seven and a half billion. Um, no surprise, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased in a similar fashion. We're fixing more nitrogen with the Haber-Bosch process than all of the Earth's um, natural processes combined. Um, as a result of changing climate, we're, we're changing the, the face of the planet in terms of land cover, and in so doing, driving a number of species on a one-way trip into the fossil record. Um, we have thermometers that we can measure. We have instruments that we could measure. We have done pretty reliably for the last hundred or so years, um, and you can see the temperature around the world is rising. Okay, that's easy to know. Um, the remarkable thing is that this year, well, this year, 2016, was the warmest year globally on record ever. It broke the record of the warmest year ever that it was in 2015, which broke the record in 2014, first time that three years in a row broke each other's records. So that's kind of remarkable. Um, Oh, we can see the temperature rising. We can see that sea level is rising. We can see that the snow cover in the Northern Hemisphere is falling. Sea ice in 2007 was the all-time minimum in the summer until 2012, which was now the all-time minimum. And 2016 tied 27. Hmm. However, the minimum winter maximum was the minimum in 2015, well, until 2016. And in fact, we're headed in the next few weeks for an all-time minimum in 2017, again, breaking those records. So I'm looking kind of carefully at the daily Arctic ice cover, and you can see the, the winter and the summer, and here was 07, here was 12, here was last year, and we're headed for a minimum here, and I predict that next summer will be another all-time minimum, but let's see about that. You can see what the, what the um, summer minima have been doing, right? You can see what the winter maximum has been doing. We're losing Arctic ice. Soon we'll be able to go sailing around the Arctic Ocean winter and summer. Um, to go past the instrumental record, you need proxies. You've got to go back into the geologic past to see what was climate before. Right? We've had good thermometers, good satellite observations only recently. So there's a number of ways we do this. Right? All these proxies that we can go back a long way in time, and I'll, I'll do that, but they all indicate that the last 10,000 years or so was a time of very stable climate, just not changing much at all. And we'll look at that. Well, going back about four and a half billion years, right, the Earth formed about 4.6 billion, all that time, the temperature of the Earth has mostly been between the freezing point and the boiling points of water, right? That's kind of amazing. Given that, the sun has not been the same strength all that time. In fact, the sun was rather cool and faint early on, has been warming up, right? If not for the greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, we'd be pretty frozen up. In fact, there are a couple of times on account of rapid photosynthesis in the oceans in the early days, about 2.2 billion years ago and 7, 10 million, 6, 40 million years ago, when the, the Earth pretty much did freeze up. 
not to the core, just most of the surface, there was glacial ice at low latitudes. Um, these are snowball earth periods, right? But other than that, for the whole time, we've had a pretty reasonably stable climate between the freezing and boiling points of water. Coming to the Phanerozoic, the last 600 million years, right? We're coming more recently, right? 600 million years only. Um, you can see the temperature has varied a little. Carbon dioxide was a lot and has come down, right? We're all up in arms now because carbon dioxide is with 400 parts per million, right? Well, we're talking about 7,000 parts per million in the past. That's a very strong greenhouse gas that was helping to keep the climate um, warm at the time with a warming up sun. So the same time the sun's getting warmer, the greenhouse gas is getting less. We're right? putting more and more carbon stored in, in, the, uh, in fossil fuels, in carbonates, in rocks. Um, so you can go back 450,000 years now. We're getting more recent, right? And you can see the glacial, interglacial cycles. And you can look at the carbon dioxide. It's gone from 280 in interglacial times to 180 in glacial times, interglacial, glacial, inter And it's in this window between 280 and 180 parts per million that seems to be a a stability window, right, of glacial interglacial times. Uh, and this is, it goes back about a million years. And we understand why the timing is about every about 100,000 years. Um, we don't exactly understand why the, the limits are 280 at the top and 180 at the bottom. Something happens at 280 parts per million that the oceans probably, or some part of the ecosystem, draws down the CO2. And when it gets to be 180, something spits it back up again, right? back and forth, and temperature follows the CO2, of course. Right, come to the last 100,000 years, the last, the last big glacial cycle, you see huge climate variability, huge climate variability until the last 10,000 years or so, at which time it's been very stable climate. Is it a coincidence that in the last 10,000 years, we had, we invented agriculture, cities, specialization, civilization as we know it, Maybe it's a coincidence, maybe not. So here's your little envelope, 280 to 180, right, for the last 450,000 years or so, and already we're up to 400 on our way up to 1,000. Whoa, we've punched out of this stability envelope. So whatever it was that was keeping us within that range of CO2 in the atmosphere, we've defeated, right? And what are the consequences of that going to be? Let's see. So let's look at what causes climate to change. On the 100,000-year glacial cycle time scale, we know that it's orbital variability, right? The, Earth, the orbit of the Earth is variably eccentric, sometimes rounder, sometimes more elliptical. Um, the tilt of the Earth changes, and the relation between these two changes, right? And that's the precession. Um, and we understand that that's pretty easy. This is Milankovitch cycling. Um, Okay, that's natural. What do people do? Well, basically two things. We emit stuff into the air and water, and we use land, meaning we cut down trees and plow up fields. Right? Those are basically the two things we do. Um, hmm. Let's just take a look at that. Well, we all know where emission com emissions come from. They come from smokestacks and tailpipes and that sort of thing, right? And we know about land use. And everybody knows what... See, what is, what is this person who's going to buy this farm going to do with it? Everybody knows, right? Fill it with houses, right? You're going to develop it. Everybody knows, right? It never occurs to anybody that somebody's going to then plant the next crop of corn. Right? You laugh, but never mind, let it revert to its natural ecosystem. Right? So, hmm, interesting. Of course, we have people. It's a people planet. Um, and a little bit of a, a depressing notion is that, yeah, we can solve a lot of issues by being more efficient, which just allows us to have more people. And the same problem comes back. Hmm. Take a look at emissions, right? Here they are. Very fine record since 1958 from the top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii, in the biggest ocean in the world, going up and up and up. This is old. This is ancient. Look how old this is. It doesn't even reach 400, right? And... and the, the sawtooth pattern here, that's the breathing of the northern hemisphere, is a seasonal bloom in the spring and summer and decay in the, in the fall and winter. 
Who's putting out the CO2? Well, China surpassed us some time ago, a few years ago. Now they put out way more CO2 than we do. And we could discuss philosophically how, who gets the credit and the blame for that kind of thing. Besides which, per capita, they certainly don't. Hmm. We're still top of that. Right? And you can look at the trends. Look at that. Flying high. Okay. Um, and where's it coming from? Coal, oil, natural gas. And by the way, making cement also emits a lot of CO2. All right. So for the emissions. Land use. We know about that is, right? You go to a forest like we have in Pennsylvania, you cut down all the trees, plant a crop. Or you can go to the Amazon and start cutting the trees and cutting the trees and cutting the trees. 2008, 2010, right? And this is what's happening all over the world, especially in the tropics. In the northern hemisphere, a lot of forests are growing back that were cut down between 300 and 100 years ago. So let's figure out the climate system. A few things we need to understand. We need to about need to over the, the radiation balance of the planet, the carbon, which is a key biogeochemical cycle, about water, feedbacks, and what are we doing? First of all, you'll know about the greenhouse effect. It's very simple, right? The air, the, tr the atmosphere is transparent to visible light. If it were not true, we couldn't see each other, right? So of course, it's, but it's not so transparent to infrared radiation, right? Slightly longer wavelength. All right. And CO2 is one of many greenhouse gases that also include water. I'll talk about that in a minute. So you get a certain amount coming down to the ground. Some of it gets reflected away. Some is absorbed by the earth. And the earth, any, with any temperature, any body radiates, um, in the case of the earth, infrared energy. Right? If it were colder, it would it would radiate something in the radio waves or microwaves if it was colder. But at, at the temperature of the Earth, it radiates in the infrared. At the temperature of the sun, 6,000 degrees, it radiates in the visible. Right? If it were hotter, it would radiate at a higher frequency. <clears throat> Simple. Okay. Um, well, you can look at the carbon and see, okay, we've got a certain amount of, of um, carbon coming out of the trees that are cut down. If you cut it down, whether you burn it or let them rot, it doesn't matter. Either way, it turns to CO2. So we have a rate of, of emissions, essentially, from land use change. So we can do the math, right? We know where, um, what, how much fossil fuel we're burning. We have a pretty good idea about the land use, and we get a certain amount of emissions, right? This some time ago, we did a calculation, and then we know where it's going. We can see it rising in the atmosphere. Right, we know that the ocean takes up some. Some gets taken up by the regrowth of northern hemisphere forests. Um, but there was this missing sink. Right? So we know it's being released. We know it's accumulating. But there's this missing sink um, you know, where mom used to wash the dishes. Um, but it's OK. We figured it out. The missing sink has been found in the terrestrial ecosystem. It turns out we were underestimating the amount of carbon uptake in the terrestrial ecosystem, and that now the, the carbon budget loop is closed. So we figured that out. That's a good news, right? So um, we can see where it goes then. Some into land use, right? Some from emissions going to the atmosphere, going to some regrowth of northern hemisphere land, and some into the oceans. So only 46% is going to the atmosphere. We get a huge discount from our emissions. It doesn't all go into the atmosphere, right? We have these natural sinks that ab absorb half the carbon that we're sticking out, which is great. So we get a great big subsidy. Um, however, while the land growth, the land uptake um, sink seems to be steady, the ocean sink seems to be declining, right? So it's, it's not able to absorb as much CO2 as quickly. And why, as you warm water, it doesn't dissolve as much CO2. If you don't believe me, open a warm bottle of champagne or soda, right? right? Cold water can dissolve more CO2, right? So the warmer the ocean, the less CO2 um, it can take up. So we can go ahead and, and model this based on our understanding of the, of the carbon cycle. And 
if you look at the um, natural forcing of what we think climate should be doing without people, right, you get these blue bands. If you, this is the model, these are numerical models. If you add people's activities to it, you get the pink band and the black line is observed. So obviously um, what we're observing is um, due to anthropogenic as well as natural forcing. There's some discussion about the mid 20th century issue here. There was a, you know, it kind of stopped warming in the middle of the 20th century, right? In a lot of the uh, places where instruments were taking, but this is pre-satellite data, right? Where instruments were, were, were measuring temperature in mostly the industrialized world, um, where we were burning coal like crazy. There were so many aerosols in the atmosphere that it was essentially shading the planet, right? And reflecting away more of the sunlight than would otherwise come. But then in the 70s, we said, wait a minute, we need clean air. So we put scrubbers on coal-fired power plants and started cleaning up our act a little bit. And the aerosols went away. The acid rain stopped as being nearly as bad. And of course, now the climate started warming again on the measurements, of course. So of course, there's no slowdown in uh, global warming. We have a very, if anything, it's increasing its rate. Um, if not for water vapor in the atmosphere, the planet would be 33 degrees centigrade colder. We'd be in a deep freeze. Water vapor is the most serious, the strongest greenhouse gas. Make no mistake about it. CO2, right, which is only 400 parts per million, right? This, this is a trace gas. But it's very important because it warms a little bit, right? The atmosphere warms a little, and then a warmer atmosphere can hold more water vapor. So more water vapor evaporates, right, and starts a positive feedback with temperature because the more water vapor you have in the atmosphere, the warmer it gets. The warmer it gets, the more water vapor can, it can hold. So the CO2 is a trigger for the um, water vapor feedback. All right, let's look at some projections. My crystal ball is as fuzzy as anybody. Um, so in comes the Intergovernmental Pan Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, right? Now it's a, thousands of scientists and, and politicians are involved across the, the world. Um, it's not a research organization. It's there to try to assess the state of the climate. Um, and it's been kind of saying the same thing for, you know, 30 years. Um, hmm. Okay, so balance of evidence in 1996 says there's something discernible that people are doing. Hmm. A little later, most is attributable to human activity. Hmm. It's very likely due to anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas concentrations and emissions, right? And finally, a few years ago, now we've put 95% confidence that indeed it, the, what we're observing is due to anthropogenic um, emissions. So kind of saying the same thing for 30 years, just in stronger and stronger terms. So what does that mean? Well, okay, you can look at the CO2 emissions, and these are various scenarios, right? Business as usual is just burn, burn it all and then do something really green. Notice how the, how the, how the reduction in emissions is, the color is green line, right? The, the, the ones that are a lot of emissions are the red lines. It's sort of a, you know, suggestion there. Um, okay, with those emissions, you get these concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, okay? Um, and never mind the sulfur. The temperature is gonna change accordingly, um, and sea level will rise accordingly. And we have representative concentration pathways. Um, so it's the, it's the representative concentration that would lead to a radiative imbalance, a radiative forcing in the um, greenhouse situation where um, there's an imbalance between the energy coming in and going out and would warm up. So in other words, the 8.5, RCP 8.5, is if 8.5 watts per meter square more energy were being retained on the planet. Okay, so this is energy balance. So that's how they're doing it now. Um, and of course, the green one is, well, they're going to get re reduced. Um, okay, fine. I'm not sure why we bother with these other ones. Because if you look at what we've actually done, right, 
we're, we've been above the maximum projection of what we were going to um, emit. Um, we've been above that, and yeah, there's a question. Maybe in 2016, the emissions would drop below the projected increase, but no, they didn't. Um, so there's the um, clean power plan, right? You've heard about the clean power plan. We're, I'm sure we're about to abandon it, but there was a, a there was an idea in the country we'd have a clean power plan. Well, gee, that would be worth about 1.3 percent of the reductions needed in the world, right, to keep the planetary temperature less than two degrees increase. One point, so a clean power plant is not going to accomplish much, but at least, at least go in that direction. Um, so we can project from the IPCC assessment report number five from 2013, and you can see what the temperature is projected to do under a very um, low emission scenario and a more likely higher emission scenario. Um, you can see what the sea ice extent will be. It will come to essentially zero pretty soon. Um, and you can look at the pH of the ocean. Ocean acidification is another consequence of climate change that wasn't even recognized 10 years ago. Um, sea level is a thing a lot of people worry about because a lot of cities are on the coast. A lot of people live on the coast. We're land animals. We like to walk around on land. So when sea level rises, we have less of it. Okay, it's simple. Um, and precipitation matters a lot. In fact, it matters more than the temperature, right? A couple of degrees hotter or colder, it happens day and night, it happens seasonally. That's not the issue. But the way it changes the climate system and the precipitation patterns is such that the um, higher latitudes will be more affected, lower latitudes less, the tropics less. But places where it's already dry are projected to get drier. Places that are wet already are projected to get wetter. So let's assume that we're going to have a peak in emissions, you know, soon, maybe now, right? And drop down in CO2 emissions thanks to renewable energy. Great. Well, the CO2 in the atmosphere will stabilize pretty quickly. Temperature will take a little longer because of the delays in the climate system, the response of the climate system to the forcing. Um, and then sea level will take much, much longer to stabilize because uh, it takes a long time to warm up the ocean. It takes an even longer time to melt all, all of Antarctic ice. So the result of the whole process of the IPCC is that we're going to be getting, you know, a fifth of a degree per decade warming, right? Okay. After that, even if we stop emitting CO2, uh, any, any greenhouse gases, we'd still have some warming because the climate system hasn't completely responded to the forcing from the 20th century. So it has some catching up to do. So eventually, you got to reduce emissions to zero, right, to stabilize climate. You know, not just 1990 levels like the Kyoto Protocol would call for. It has to be zero, right? Otherwise, you're gonna, you don't confuse stocks and fluxes. People did that with the Kyoto Protocol, right? That was just, that just reduced the rate at which we add CO2 to the atmosphere to the rate that it was in 1990, which was formidable. It wasn't, it wasn't zero. All right. And the thing about IPCC is that it's just been wrong and wrong and wrong in underestimating the rates and the amounts of change in every case. Hmm. This guy, Stefan Ramsdorf, smart guy at pick. He got frustrated. Well, let's look at some of the impacts globally, right? What are some of the obvious things? Well, you got the storms, you got the sea level, floods and droughts, any kind of change in hydrology is you know, pretty bad for, for everybody. Um, agriculture, diseases. Everybody remembers Hurricane Sandy? How do we forget, right? Came, right? We had a little discussion about it. Is it, uh, you know, the new norm? Well, probably yes. And um, so, uh, you can't blame climate change on a particular I mean, You can't blame climate change for any event, right? Hurricanes happen. They always have happened, right? But they'll become more frequent, and as the ocean water warms more, um, they'll become more powerful and extend farther north than they used to. Okay, but you, can't, you don't blame a hurricane on, oh, that means there's global change. Not necessarily, not a single one. You have to look at the long-term record. I went down the shore. 
you, you remember all these kind of images from, um, from Sandy, right? Flooding big time from the storm surge. Um, when malaria is contracted in Washington, D.C., we may see some people get more worried about climate change there. Um, there are very few people worried about climate change there now. Um, and there will be changes in the thermohaline circulation system. This is the, the ocean conveyor belt where water sinks down in the North Atlantic and also around Antarctica, goes down the bottom water, goes welling up in, in the Pacific and comes back to the surface current that comes up past North America as the Gulf Stream. Right? And there's already indications that this current is slowing down a little bit. It's, it's weakening a little bit. Any change in climate, especially precipitation patterns, will lead to a change in agricultural productivity. And you're going to have winners and losers, but notice how many of the losers are where most of the people are. Hmm. Let's look at sea level. It's rising. And why? One, ice melts, goes into the ocean, right? So glaciers, these are glaciers, fine. Two, water, like anything else, expands when heated. So, you know, heat up the climate, heat up the water, it's going to expand and raise sea level, right, without changing the mass. And third, we actually move water around the planet enough to affect sea level. We do it ourselves. That's a big uncertainty, though. Um, and we... we mine fossil aquifers, we, and on the, conversely, we build dams, right? But we don't build dams anymore, not big ones. Um, so we can see sea level have been rising after the melting of the, as a part of the melting of the ice sheets, right? That maxed out about 18,000 years ago. Um, but for the last 8,000 years or so, during the Holocene, very stable sea level. So sea level and climate have both been very stable for the last eight to 10,000 years. So what do we do about sea level now that it's rising? We could build more dams and store more water on land, but we'd run out of land pretty soon, so maybe we shouldn't do that. Um, we could do other, we could sequester water on land in other ways, like by filling up holes in the ground, like the Tarim Basin's worth a meter of sea level all by itself. You know, pump it over the Himalaya and it'll come into the Tarim Basin, fill it up, make a great big lake. Um, not sure what the climate implications of that would be. Um, or we could just, you know, reduce emissions that are causing the change of the climate that caused the sea level rise, right? Okay, well, let's look a little closer to home, right? There are regional impacts. Um, the various climate models are indicating that we are going to come into a climate that looks more like El Nino climate than previously, right? We've always had the El Nino-La Nina variation. And that means that um, in the winter, in the winter, it's going to be wetter around here, right, in general. Um, and in the summer, it's going to be drier. Well, when do we really like to have the rain? Well, you know, at night when I'm asleep. But besides that, when we're going to grow crops and plants, right? So that's the summer, not the winter. Um, so what happens when you get more winter rain is you get flooding. Um, so this is, uh, I think this is right in downtown um, New Brunswick, in New Jersey. I gotta wonder if the guys who were riding these uh, jet skis fed the meters. Maybe that's the meter made. Um, there's, there's no risk of getting flooded on a floodplain. There's just a guarantee. It's a floodplain. That's how it got there. Um, Pennsylvania, and you can see how old this is, Pennsylvania would be the, if it were a country, it would be the 20th bigger, biggest emitter in the world. Whoa, now this is so old that China still hasn't caught up to the U.S. in this one, right? Uh, if you looked at the China's emissions now, it would be out here somewhere, off the, off the chart. Hmm. Um, so depending on what we do, in the Northeast, we'll feel it differently. Okay, so if we go on a, a lesser global emissions, Right? We might go on this path. If you go on more global emissions, we might go on that path. Right? But either way, we're still responding to the emissions and the CO2 concentration increase from the 20th century. So for a while, it won't make a difference. Right? But th later it will. So we've got to think a little bit uh, longer term than we usually do. Um, so you want like to 
move to Atlanta? Who wants to live in Georgia? Well, if you do, stick around here in Eastern Pennsylvania. We're headed there, right? <clears throat> Another thing about the changes in precipitation, they're expected to have more extreme events, right? Bigger rainfalls, so not just a, a change in the average annual precipitation, but in bigger chunks, um, which leads to, of course, flooding. Um, and more variability means also more drought, especially in the summer. Right, and here we are in eastern Pennsylvania feeling that. Um, and winter. I remember it well. Um, been outside lately? Yeah. So here's what we expect for this part of Pennsylvania, right, eastern Pennsylvania. Warming, right, by 2100, considerable warming. Um, more rain, but mostly in the winter, not in the summer where we need it, drier in the summer. Um, and that's a thing. So what are we going to do about it? Right? What do we do? There's two things you can do. In fact, there's two things you have to do. One is to stop bad things from happening. That's mitigation. Mitigate it. Don't let it happen. The other is adapt. Right? Deal with the change. If you can't stop it, you're going to have to live with it. So one way or the other, you're going to do a combination of these two. The only choice we get is how much of each. Hmm. Well, step in science. In the 20th century, we ivory tower scientists and industrial scientists too were considered like industrialists. We're going to go out there and exploit natural resources, find more energy sources, fossil fuels of course, and build up the economy. Right? That was the 20th century. 21st century, oops, what happened? Now we're treated more a bit like physicians. Please look at these problems that we've created in the 20th century. So I call this kind of a scientific transition in the millennium, right? So here we're industrialists doing all this um, exploitation of resources, and now, oops, look what look at all that exploitation did. We have environmental impacts, climate change that we'd like to understand and help mitigate. All right. Well, in order to do that, of course. You know, policy is going to rear its ugly head. You've got to actually do something as not just one government, but all of them. Um, and uh, it's uh, sometimes difficult to do that. I was at the United Nations a couple of years ago. And um, the idea was to, to put together, to join the millennium goals of, the, of 2000, which included eradicating poverty, with the post-2015 agenda, which included stopping climate change, right? Great idea. Who's all for it, right? The problem is, and I, I mean, this, this is the United Nations, supposed to be the, the brightest minds in the world, right? I had to go tell them, it's like, well, poor people don't change climate. So, you know, quoting JFK, ask not what climate change will do to the vulnerable and impoverished, susceptible populations of the world, rather ask what economic development of 7 billion people will do to climate change. It didn't occur to them. Really? So, um, so much for reconciling the Millennium Goals and the post-2015 agenda, right? So, um, you know, there's convenient and inconvenient uh, truths. Um, okay. Most people agree that if we keep things within two degrees of pre-industrial the fundamental structure of the Earth system won't really change that much, right? So we have that much wiggle room to play with, right? To do that, though, we've got to bring CO2 from 400 that it is now back down to 350, right? Which we could do just by stopping um, emissions because those sinks are still working, right? The ocean and, and, and uh, terrestrial sinks are still working, right? In order to do that, then we've got to bring greenhouse gas emissions down a lot within the next couple of decades. Um, and how are we going to do that? Well, here we come to sustainable energy sources. This is you guys, right? So uh, there you are. And still, there are people that don't acknowledge, they don't want to believe that climate is changing. Well, that seems kind of silly. And they, they make these various claims, right? Um, and um, I mean, what is a bigger greenhouse gas than CO2? Yes, it is. Of course it is. We know that, 
right? But CO2 is a trigger that starts that water um, positive feedback. Um, can you read that? So don't believe the mechanics and the ones who studied the problem, right? Instead, believe these other random people, right? And as it turned out, after Copenhagen and then Paris, we got on the plane, it crashed, you know, okay. Um, disinformation, hmm. Misinformation is just wrong. It's a mistake, it's an error. Disinformation is a lie when you know better. They're different, right? So, and we've been doing it for centuries, right? I mean, Galileo, right? Well, it's so 17th century, right? We know better now, right? Well, then there was a Scopes trial, and, well, that's 20th century. We're in the 21st century now. We know better now. Well, not really, right? Climate gate, where these guys hacked into the University of East Anglia computer systems and hacked all these emails and took a bunch of little pieces out of context and said, look, the scientific cabal is trying to pull the wool over the world's eyes and for their own, I don't know, what, what does the scientific community get from climate change, you know? <laughs> it's not like, we don't get paid for this, right? So, um, so yeah, how do, we, how do we deal with that? In fact, what if scientists did have that kind of mindset, right? Well, then what scientists should do then is say, oh, it's fine, don't worry about climate change. You know, burn the coal, it's, it, no problem. And 50 years from now, when it really starts getting serious, then, then scientific insights will be in high value, right? But scientists don't think that way. Right? That's not a personal gain, so it's kind of a silly thing. So, um, so we can answer some basic questions, right? Is climate changing? Until you answer that yes, there's no sense going on with the rest of the questions, right? There's no sense attributing climate change if you don't think there is any. You look around, you see it, you observe it. Okay, do we have any to do it? Of course they do, right? It's emissions and in part land use. Okay, is it bad? Now that's a normative question. Is it bad? Well, scientists can't tell you what's good or bad, right? That's philosophy or something, right? It's different, right? However, we can scientifically look at the past, look at the changes, look at the impacts on agricultural systems, on coastal cities, on all kinds of things, and we can project what those are, and then you can decide for yourself. Is that bad? Are starving people bad? Is flooded cities bad? You know, up to individuals to decide. But okay, there you are. So you get through that one. Well, can we do anything about it? Right? And the answer is yes. It's not too late. The sinks, the natural sinks, are still operating. They're not saturated yet. Right? So if we stop burning fossil fuels, we can indeed do something about it. Right? And then finally, is it worth it? Shall we bother? Right? I mean, until you get through all this, nothing's going to be done, right? Nothing, nobody's going to change their behavior until you get through all of these. And the answer is yes, again, it is worth doing something about if you just do the economic analysis. The cost of changing our energy systems, even given the, the investments we have in infrastructure now, using, that are based on fossil fuels, the cost of changing to renewable energy and sustainable energy sources is way less than the cost of moving cities, for example, and changing agricultural practices and, and diseases that are going to be changing their disease vectors. I mean, there's going to be a huge cost involved in adapting to climate change, much more than mitigating it. Right? So you can do the economic analysis of that, and it's been done. Um, oh, a bit of a, a, a geopolitical a little uh, ditty here. Um, most people think that Al Gore got the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize for telling the story of climate change better to all the world than all the scientists in all the world could do for 30 years before that. But the scientific community knows better. The scientific community knows that he got the Nobel Prize for figuring out how to steer the course of hurricanes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, which brings us to sustainability. Um, this is a word that's used a little too much, I think, right? Oh, look how sustainable we are. It's like, well, what, what does that mean? It's not an adjective. Um, and this is the definition in 1987, right? The Bruntland Commission figured that out. Um, but we cheat because we declare that future generations 
don't need to consume as much as we do. They don't need as much energy. They don't need clean water or air. They can fill their needs other ways, that, but our needs are more than their needs, right? Well, that's, to me, that doesn't make it, right? So I would define it this way, right? Doing what can be done indefinitely without altering the environmental conditions or depleting the resources that enable everybody to do it, not just a few people. Hmm, very different, right? Which brings us to the economy. We are trust fund kids. We live off the interest that the global ecosystem provides at the rate that it provides ecosystem goods and services. Right? And, and we, we've always lived off that interest, right? And any trust fund manager knows it's anathema to allow the spoiled brat to eat into the principal, right? Or there is you reduce the, the yield. You can't do that, right? Well, in the 20th century, we became very naughty trust fund kids, and we figured out how to use up the principal. We were very want to take more now, right? Not wait for the rate of provision of ecosystem goods and services. 20th century. So now we have less environmental goods and services being provided because we have less um, principal, right? So the yield is less. So in the 21st century, we have to figure out how to get more out of a lower principal. Very difficult. Which finally brings us to sustainable energy. I call it sustainable energy because some of it's not really renewable per se. Not that you should have to change all of you know, Mariah's name or anything, but we'll, we'll come to that. A friend of mine said, I don't have any kids. I'm not the problem. I want to burn fossil fuels. How many of me can we support? Interesting question. So I did the math, right? We know how much what our, our, our global resources are of coal, gas, and oil, right? We know pretty well. We know what the reserves are, and don't confuse reserves and reser resources. Reserves are the amount that you can dig out of the ground and make it worth it at today's prices to make a profit. Right? So reserves can increase as the price goes up, right? But the resources are just total amount in the ground. Okay, well, I, I assume, assumed a few things, like it was made for the last 100 million years, and we know what the U.S. consumption is, we know the number of people that are in the U.S. and doing it, so we could support on coal 44 or so, maybe 45,000 people. So altogether, about 50,000 Americans could be supported forever on the rate at which fossil fuels have been created, right, over the last 100 million years. And, it's not really true, but it's, uh, it's actually less, but it's okay for a ballpark. The thing is, we already have more than 50,000 Americans, and we've got 7 billion more that want to consume like Americans. So there you go. So fossil fuels, not sustainable. It almost all comes from the sun, right? From the sun, of course, solar power, wind, because of differential heating of the planet, hydro, because the hydrologic cycles are driven by the sun, right? Oil, gas, and coal all come from the sun, not from the sun, millions of years ago, right? Because you know, oil comes from, it's not dead dinosaurs, it's dead phytoplankton in the ocean, micro -marine, marine microorganisms make oil, and, and dead land plants make coal, right? Okay. Um, hmm. So uh, the problem is sustainable energy sources are typically more expensive than fossil fuels. And why should that be? Well, because we just pay for the cost of delivery, right? We externalize the cost of creating the oil and the coal and the natural gas to process it in the geologic past, right? That makes it the nice concentrated, convenient liquids that we can then burn. So if you buy energy from a, you know, windmill company, right, you can only get the energy at the rate at which the sun heats the earth in real time. Okay, in real time. Um, when you buy fossil fuels, you've externalized the cost of concentrating millions of years of solar energy in a convenient form. If you were to buy a cell phone from a you know, company, I did that, you know, bought a cell phone, you know, you pay the company. Well, they had to go and they had to invent it, develop it, mine the materials, hire the people, make a factory, test it, market it, sell it. You give them money, and they're going to use that money to make another cell phone. Or you could buy a cell phone from the kid who stole it off a truck. I bet you could buy it cheaper from the kid who stole it off the truck. And why? The kid has no intention of using the money to make another cell phone. No intention at all. 
So you buy energy from a sustainable energy company, and they're going to use that money to keep maintaining the systems that keep the energy flowing. You buy oil from an oil company, and they have no intention to use that money to make more oil. Not going to happen, right? So um, no wonder. Well, there you go. So really, the only free thing is the sun and the things that come from the sun, right? And that's kind of why I call it sustainable energy rather than renewable energy. We're not going to renew the sun, right? I mean, it's going to burn out in, you know, six or eight billion years more, and that's going to be the end of it, right? We're not worried about that time frame of sustainability, right? But at least for the next few billion years, the sun will keep burning, keep shining on us, and we can continue getting sustainable energy from it and all the things that it does. All right. Um, that's what I don't call it renewable. Really, renewable is only biomass, right? Trees grow in the lifetime of, an, of a human, right? And you can make more, switch grass, that kind of thing. Um, so what do we do? First of all, what do we call ourselves? We have rights. We have advocates. We call ourselves consumers. We don't call ourselves preservers, restorers, sustainers. We call ourselves consumers. So until we alter that mindset, I don't expect we're going to see much change. Hmm. So um, where does that lead us? Mitigation or adaptation, which means you avoid the unmanageable. You mitigate what you can, right, so that you can manage the unavoidable so that you can adapt to what you can't mitigate, right? Um, so that's the only choice we have is the, the balance between those two. And even if we stopped all fossil fuel burning now, we would still have to adapt to things that are the consequence of what happened already in the 20th century. So, um, so that's the bottom line there. All right, I will end there and um, you know, entertain questions, discussion, outrage, or anything else you like. <laughs> questions? <laughs> Oh, this is home, by the way. It's the only one we got. Yes? Question about the atmosphere. I think I could probably drive my car through the atmosphere in about an hour. It's pretty, it's not that big around the planet. So, in the, and I'm thinking that, and I don't know for sure, and I've wondered, is the CO2 mostly going into the stratosphere? No, the CO2 is mixed throughout throughout the entire atmosphere, the water vapor is only in the troposphere. So the stratosphere and above is dry, right? But the CO2 goes everywhere. And that does make a big difference in terms of the thickening of the blanket of greenhouse gases that CO2 contributes to in the stratosphere that water does not. So water is only limited to the, to the troposphere. <coughs> yeah? What about methane? Methane. Mm, what about methane? About... 20 times stronger greenhouse gas than CO2, um, and we emit it too. I didn't talk much about it. Um, there's, a, there's another positive feedback. Positive feedbacks are, are like bad, right? You know, it's not like, oh, mom, I got positive feedback on my English paper. No, it's, it's not that kind of positive feedback. Positive feedback is a vicious cycle, right? Like when you, if, I, if I did something too close to the microphone, right, that's positive feedback. Um, and as we warm especially the northern latitudes where a lot of methane is frozen in the, in the frozen peatlands, that methane will be released. And that's a positive feedback. The warmer it gets, the more it gets released. Furthermore, there's methane trapped in, in a special kind of ice in the bottom of the ocean. Um, and it's stable only for a very specific temperature and pressure. Um, so if we raise sea level, change the pressure, or change the temperature, that'll become unstable. And there's some indication that there was a thermal maximum in the, in the, in the Paleocene Eocene transition, where, where about 50 million years ago, um, where there was a big burp of methane out of the oceans at that time that led to a huge warming until the methane decayed. Eventually, it oxidizes in the atmosphere to CO2, right? So it doesn't last that long. CO2 lasts essentially forever, or until there's a sink, right? It's a stable thing. It's the most oxidized you can make carbon, and methane is the most reduced. 
So in an oxygen atmosphere, it's going to oxidize, right? Essentially, it rusts or burns, depending on the rate. So yeah, methane is an issue, um, and it will contribute to more climate change. Yeah. The albedo. Well, yes. The poles are the canary in the coal mine, right? Um, they are much more sensitive to, um, to climate change than the tropics for a number of reasons. One, they're smaller, but especially they don't have the cloud cover that buffers the, the tropics. Um, and the poles are the, the destination for heat. So the tropics heat up they'll still export it to the poles, um, which can stay cold as long as they're ice-covered because ice has an albedo of essentially, you know, one, right? Very reflective, snow and ice, right? Um, water has an albedo of essentially zero, so any, any, you know, sunlight that comes in warms the water a lot but would reflect off ice. So the less ice there is, the more water there is, the faster it warms, the less ice there is, the more water it is faster it warms, um, which is part of the reason why we're losing the Arctic ice so quickly, right? And we're at a threshold. You know, I'm making a prediction of what the, what the ice cover is going to be, and I think I understand why, the, um, why there's no two minimum summer record-breaking years in a row in, Arcti in the Arctic ice, like there's in temperature, global temperature, right? But that's only going to hold for a while, right? That rule, because pretty soon the albedo is not just going to matter anymore because there's going to be so much water, it's going to quickly... Um, destabilize and, and melt real fast. So, uh, so the albedo is an important factor. It also is a factor in land use because forests absorb energy, but deserts reflect it. So deserts are a cold place in terms of planetary radiative to balance, whereas forests are, are a warm place. Yeah. Uh, uh, people will make uh, comments like, say, uh, there could be a volcano erupting that's emitting large quantities Yeah. Warming in general. Are there are there things that you can say to debunk that? Sure, a lot of things. First of all, um, we we are in a warming period after the glaciation. We're kind of at a at a. We should eventually be going into another glaciation, but we forestalled that. That's not going to happen, right? Not now. We re released fossil fuels there from the geologic, geologic record back into the atmosphere, so that's not going to happen. Um, but the um, the natural issue um, is minuscule in terms of the rate of warming after glaciation, and we've kind of topped out. Now it's completely anthropogenic. That's good news. It's really good news that what we've observed is a consequence of 20th century emissions because there is some uncertainty in the rate of response of the climate system to 20th century emissions, right? So if what we've observed is natural variability, then the anthropogenic effect, which is the, the, the climate change due to the increased CO2 in the atmosphere, that has to happen, we're just not so sure when, is yet to come. The good news is no, it's not going to be one on top of the other. There hasn't been a natural, it's just anthropogenic. So what we see is what, we, what we've done, as opposed to we have yet to see it happen on top of what was already happened. Right, so it's actually good news that they're wrong, right? I mean, if you like less climate change being good news, right? Good and bad, again, is a value judgment, right? Um, so, yeah, uh, there's a lot of things one can you know, say. There are some pretty cool websites like the Real Science or Real Climate and some others that, are, that, are, that go through the list of contrarian objections one by one and basically explain why they shouldn't. That why it's not true. Here's the problem. This, this came up in December when I was at the, the AG, the American Geophysical Union meeting, and there was a session about explaining uh, teaching climate science or something like that. And um, this one woman got up and made it pretty clear to me that all this only matters if people consider science as a viable 
worldview. Because a lot of people don't. And, and it turns out, and now there's you know, some better evidence that I still have to learn about some neurological issues and, and neuroscience and things that people are learning now that, that the decision-making centers of the brain are more closely related to the emotional centers than they are to the logical and reasoning centers. So people make decisions based on emotional response to any variety of things as opposed to logical thinking about the cause and effect. Um, that's scary, right? But if, if this is true, which, you know, look at, thinking, looking around, maybe it is, um, that means that all this that we've been talking about, all this education, all the science, all the knowledge just doesn't matter, right? If people are going to make decisions based on something else. So that's, that's the thing. You know, so yeah. People object to saying it's warmer than, you know, 2015 is warmer than 2014 because the uncertainties in those measurements are bigger than the difference between the difference. Yeah, and, and uncertainty, uncertainty, which is inherent in any measurement, right? All measurements have uncertainty, right? Scientists deal with this every day because you're going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, measure the length of this room. It's going to be so many meters, so many centimeters, plus or minus some amount of measurement error, right? It has to be. Um, and scientists have learned how to live with uncertainty you know, forever, ever since measurements have been made. Um, the general public and especially policymakers and judges have a hard time dealing with uncertainty, right? They have to be sure, right, beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's difficult. So it's a different kind of way of thinking. Um, so yes, there's uncertainty in each of the measurements of every year of temperature. There's uncertainty in each individual temperature measurement because it's a, it's a thermometer. So it's going to have some degrees, plus or minus some amount. Um, you add those all together. And as you concatenate multiple measurements of the same thing, the uncertainty reduces, but never to zero. Right? So uncertainty is reduced as you have more and more measurements. Um, but there's always a small amount of uncertainty in this whole in, – in, in every scientific paper that involves multiple measurements, you have to do a, 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 an error analysis, right? So that's part of it. Um, there's no reason to think that the uncertainty is changing so that the center of your error bars, as that rises, that's the best information we've got. Um, a really big uncertainty is in the balance of – Antarctic ice. Um, ice streams are moving faster, but it's also snowing more. So which way is it going? Is the ice sheet growing or is it shrinking? And it's hard to know exactly. Greenland is clearly shrinking and losing mass fast, and we, and we know that. But Antarctica, which is much bigger, is more uncertain. Um, so uncertainty is something that we have to live with every day. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should not interpret our re best results to make decisions, right? Don't the generals say that uh, if you wait until you're absolutely sure of the situation, the war's already lost or the battle's already lost, right? It's too late. If you have to wait till you have all the intel you absolutely need with, with perfect precision, you've, you've, your ship has sailed already, right? So that's, that's, that's the issue with uncertainty. Question? various things that have been measured. In the latest projections of sea rise, temperature rise, etc., has that been taken into account, or is it well, using the wrong or a low estimates? No, we're, we're, we're above, we're above the, the most recent projections were made in 2013. Well, but they weren't really made in 2013. It was published in 2013. But in addition to being underestimates, they're also usually out of date. 
Um, in order to get into the IPCC process, you have uh, to, uh, some scientific body or some a scientist, call it some some scientist, who's going to do some research. You know, going to get it funded, going to go out collect data, going to do some research, analyze it, write up a paper. So that's a few years already now. Write a paper, a few years after the data was collected. Write a paper, submit it to review, get it through review, maybe some revision, get it published. So there's another year, right? In order to be involved in the IPC process, everything has to have been published in the peer review literature first. So all that has to happen first. Then you start the IPCC process. Another round of review and vetting. And then you start writing it. So in the end, you're about five years behind, right? So, so they're out of date as well as underestimated um, in the IPCC process. It doesn't mean it's not a, a valid process. It's just extremely conservative. It's very, very careful never to overestimate, and it's always behind. So reality is kind of ahead of it, right? I mean, it was 2007 when the fourth assessment report came out in, like, September. And they didn't even predict that that year would be the all-time Arctic ice low in October, right? I mean, it was just, just then it happened, and it was not predicted because it was based on data from years previous because of the process. Yeah. Yes, they do. Well, it's, um, yes. It depends on when you're measuring it, right? In the late 19th century, you went to the cities where people lived, and you looked at the thermometers. Maybe you had ships with thermometers that are going across the ocean, measuring air temperature. More recently, we have weather stations all over the world, right? So we have a lot more centers for, for you know, th thermometer measurement data. Furthermore, now we have satellites. So we can look down and see what the surface temperature of the planet is everywhere. At some resolution that I'm not sure what it is, if it's a kilometer or, or half a degree grid, but there's a, you know, there's a, a grid, there's a gridded data that we have temperatures for the whole world, including the oceans. And it's the oceans that really matter because the atmosphere has no heat capacity. It's just, you know, the atmosphere is just the tail of the dog. The ocean is the dog. So as a little bit of warming in the ocean is, has, it takes a lot more heat than changing the temperature of the atmosphere. So we had been only, only measuring the atmosphere, but now we can measure the, the ocean also. And so our more recent um, measurements are much, much more accurate. Um, so, you know, you can, let me distinguish surface temperature from air temperature. The surface temperature of a, of a surface, like, you know, a parking lot, is a surface, right? Really hot, depending on its albedo. If you walk barefoot across a parking lot in the summer, ooh, ah, hot, hot, right? Step on the white lines, ah, better, right? I don't know if you've tried it. Try it next summer or, or tomorrow if it keeps up like this. Um, <laughs> so um, that's a surface temperature. That is not the same as the air temperature, you know, two meters above it, right? The air temperature is different because, because that surface temperature, the surface would be radiating in the infrared, but that'll go through the air. So it takes a long time for the surface to warm up the air, which is why the urban heat island effect is much stronger in the early evening at night than it is during the day, because it takes all day for the, for the air that's near the ground to warm up to the surface temperature. Um, so, uh, so that's the difference between surface temperature that you can measure from satellites very nicely now and, and the local air temperature. Yeah. So you think about this a lot, and you bring up two points, mitigation and adaptation. Mm -hmm. So if you, on a writ large scale, your top three mitigators, mitigations for the next 50 years and your top three adaptations. Ah, tough question. The mitigation question is easier, right? Yeah, Stop. Yeah, okay, but both. You mitigation, ah, absolutely. And, and mitigation is easy, and you guys are all about it, right? Renewable energy or sustainable energy sources, right? Land use, 
also, but we're not going to, nobody can say, except maybe China, we're going to mitigate by reducing population or by reducing the rate of increase of population, right? We're not saying that, right? UN won't even discuss it, right? And, no, and nobody but a totalitarian government like China could even contemplate it, right? So that's not going to be a mitigation measure, right? So mitigation is going to be, okay, we're going to have a lot of people, they want more energy, and it can't be fossil fuels. So it's got to be a huge increase in the development of sustainable energy sources. We know how to make windmills. We know how to make dams. We know how to use passive solar energy. We know how to make solar collectors of various sorts. And we're working on and need to work a lot harder on more efficient photovoltaic cells, right? Because they're not as efficient as they should be using not nearly enough wavelengths of the incident sunlight. So that's, that's a mitigation side. Well, and not to mention nuclear fusion, right? It's nuclear, not nuclear. Sound like a moron. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but fusion, which we're not working on very hard, would be a, a huge um, boost in our, in our ability to generate um, pretty much environmentally friendly you know, energy and sustainable in that there's so much hydrogen in the ocean that it's essentially you know, inexhaustible. Um, mitigation. Adaptation, okay, now, we know there's going to be some changes. We know sea levels rising. We know there's going to be additional um, impacts of more severe storms. How do you adapt? Well, for one thing, we move inland, right? We got to. We could. We didn't when New Orleans got flooded, but we could, right? Instead, we rebuilt New Orleans below sea level while it's rising in the path of exacerbated hurricanes after having wiped out the, the coastal ecosystem that, you know, that, that mitigates storm surge. So we built it right back where it was. Again, people make decisions based on emotions, not on logic and science. And, and, and so, so, yeah, so here's how we can adapt. Will we do it? Yes, but we may do it the hard way. Um, there's other ways that we'll adapt. Farmers are actually really smart. Right? I mean, they plant a crop, they want it to grow, they want to sell it as a profit. They will change what they plant according to projected climate change, and farmers care a lot about that, right? especially when we have regions, as we do in the east, of rain-fed agriculture. Right? We don't irrigate like they do out west. Right? Out west, they irrigate, okay, they'll just keep doing it anyway. Right? If it gets a little bit drier, they'll irrigate a little bit more. Here, it matters more. And a lot of marginal croplands throughout Africa, Asia, Australia, there's a lot of places where it's just enough to have rain-fed agriculture, right? They'll be much more concerned. So that's another way to adapt, see what's coming, and change what you're growing, right, to feed all the people, because we're not going to have less people. Um, other ways to adapt, um, be careful of the disease vectors, right? In Washington, doctors should learn the symptoms of malaria, for example, right? Because in Africa, it's no problem. They see when we get malaria, okay, we know what it is. We take care of it, treat it, they get better usually. But if somebody showed up in America with it, like, well, what was that? What's that? You know, start treating the wrong thing. Um, so there's a number of ways to adapt. And the question is how we choose to and when we choose to. Like, all right, we might adapt by rebuilding New Orleans again in the same place. Okay, that's a choice. Right? It's not one that science, you know, science can inform the process, but science can't make the decision, right? Scientists can just say, here's the situation, and policymakers and the public have to do something about it. And so far, they've been pretty bad about following the logical sequence of cause and effect. Um, yeah. Um, you know, Cassandra was... Right, Cassandra was, was Greek mythology, right? So, um, you know, she was given a, a great gift from the gods that she could foresee the future, right? And at the same time, was given a curse that when she spoke, no one believed her. <laughs> so here we are. 
Okay, it's time. Can sure. we be able to hang out for a little while? Sure. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, uh, we're going to wrap it there so that anybody who needs to get on the road tonight can. But Dork kindly agreed to stay around and answer some more questions if you want to chat with them. So thanks again. Great talk.